This is the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. All right, I'm going to zap her again. Charge up the paddles. Come on, let's go, let's go. Sorry, don't. Hold the compressions. Clear. Straight line. Good evening and welcome to Rock and Roll Autopsy. We are the forensic files on your radio dial. My name is Scott. And have we got a great show for you tonight? No, we don't. Damn it. The phone is ringing again. It's the request line. (sighs) All right, let's pick it up. WRNRA, East of the Rockies. Hey, breather, what's going on, man? You feel like 80s horror movies are just exploitative, misogynistic tripe that glorifies violence against women, debases its audience for profit, and contributes to the moral decline of society? Yeah, I hear you. Worst of all, they're not even scary. What do you mean the only thing that scares you is our uncanny ability to consistently crank out more and more juvenile and sophomoric rock and roll podcasts? Listen, you called the request line. Is there a song you'd like us to perform an autopsy on? I said. (laughs) Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter by Iron Maiden? You got it. All right, buckle up, gang. The subject of our rock and roll autopsy tonight will be Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter by new wave of British heavy metal titans, Iron Maiden. We'll get the show started after these very important messages from our sponsors. What's up, music nerds? Are you tired of wading through a sea of mediocre music, desperately seeking to find a glimmer of greatness? You're in luck. My name is Mark, and I am the host of the podcast, Songs That Don't Suck. Each week, I scour the depths of new music playlists to unearth hidden gems that defy the trends and deliver pure sonic bliss. No matter the genre, if it doesn't suck, it's on my radar. So find us on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe today. And as always, keep searching for and listening to Songs That Don't Suck. Breaking news! What is this garbage you're watching? I want to watch the news. This is the news. All right, gang, we've got our intrepid rock and roll beat reporter on the line, Rico Gnu. How the hell are you? I'm great. How are you? Not too shabby, man. I got to know what's going on in the world of rock and roll. So, uh, like my favorite soap opera, here's how it goes. Like sands through the hourglass, so are the daves of our lives. You like that? So are the daves of our lives. Part two in our ongoing David Lee Roth uh, adventures. Um, so now, if if any of you out there remember our previous episode, we talked about how David Lee Roth popped off with the this fucking kid comment and told a couple of stories how we booted some you know people from the concert and we we talked about all of that. Well, Scott and everybody out there, um, David Lee Roth has doubled down on his previous comments um, by posting um, some audio on YouTube for which we are going to play it in its entirety here in about 15 seconds. It's only a couple of minutes long, and trust me, you're going to want to listen to this. And then um, we'll talk about it for a second. So here we go, Scott. This is David Lee Roth. 
before we get started today, I would I just want to say something that without all the music and all the comedy and everything, that I know I've upset some people, and I, I love my old rock band, and I miss Ed, and I didn't mean to upset anybody, and I would just... Don't turn the mic off. I, uh, I feel so wrong. I, I did something so wrong. Psych. Fuck you. Good morning, Wolf. Hi, Doctor. What brings you in this morning? Well, I've been grunting and straining and pushing and... I can't get any streams. We've talked about this, Wolfgang. I know, but... What do you think it is? Young man, I think you're old enough for you to truly understand. Your album was DOA. Dead on Arrival. KTC. Kick to the Curb. A complete FP. A complete face plan. Your son, commercially speaking, you got your ass handed to you. Both cheeks? Both. Is there anything I can do to push them back together? Fortunately, Wolfgang, there are some dynamic new innovations in the medical entertainment industry field. We can glue your little bottom back together, but it's going to be medically and financially invasive. That sounds like it's gonna hurt. Well, the bad news is you owe a lot of money to the record company. I do. And we can solve that, but we're going to have to call the lawyer. Uh-oh. And what happens when we call the lawyer? He puts on the meter. And what happens when the lawyer puts on the meter? His grandkids go to Princeton? That's right. And somebody's got to pay for that lawyer to put on the meter. Like in a taxi. More like a fighter jet. But I don't want to pay for a fighter jet to go through Princeton. And neither did your Uncle Al or Mr. Roth. Wolfgang. Yeah? Do you remember Leon Spinks? No. How about Larry Holmes or Trevor Burbank? Uh Uh-uh. Well, these were the last couple of Muhammad Ali's fights, and nobody wants to remember them because they were no fun. You mean like the throw-in in Manila or the year of Zaire? Exactly. And your albums with Van Halen are a lot like those last two fights. You have the floor, Mr. Um, well, for one thing, this was, this was something else, man. When this dropped, um, (laughs) I will say this, Dave still got it. You know, this, this harkens back to, um, more sketch comedy eighties Dave that we saw on MTV so much growing up when we were little tykes, you know what I mean? So Dave still got it, man. Um, that was very well done. Um, I think the crux of the biscuit here is Wolfie has been on Eddie Trunk and elsewhere, and he keeps getting peppered with questions about why a different kind of truth is no longer on the streaming services. And Wolfie has been, he said, well, some people involved don't want it on the streaming services. And inquiring minds like Eddie Trunk said, would those some people go by three initials? And uh, (laughs) Wolfie says, well, yeah, you can put it together. He doesn't like the album. And so I think what it really comes down to is not a matter of whether or not he likes the album, but Roth is acknowledging that the album was a commercial failure and that the cost of basically renegotiating the rights of the uh, of the music and renegotiating a new contract with the streaming services would far outweigh whatever tiny profit they might see out of out of streams themselves and so i think he's giving uh wolfie uh a funny but probably um kind of mean and not necessary um lesson in the music business um yeah to to that point i I think you're you're spot on listen um i i with regard to dave's delivery on this and his creativity at all oh yeah he's still he's still got it for sure i think the problem here is the is is 
how he's directing it to Wolfie in the way that he's directing it to Wolfie. It doesn't have to happen this way, especially on the heels of our previous discussion about this with the this fucking kid comment. I just... I don't, man, it's so hard because, like, you made this harder for me to think about because I had a really strong opinion about it before you made your point, and it was a really fucking good point. Like, Dave's delivery on that was pretty goddamn funny, actually, even though it was really inappropriate, and he was kind of giving Wolfie a lesson in the music industry from his perspective, and I think he Wolfgang probably, there's, there's a part of me that, that, has to believe that he's kind of already aware of that because he grew up in the biz right and i'm sure that both his dad and his uncle have both given given him a lot of information on this i'm sure he's really fully aware of the the parameters here i think that and, and i don't i don't claim to know what the people's real motivation is i know dave's real motivation i'll get to that in a minute but uh i think wolfie has a little bit of a different perspective here I, I i really just think he just wants to get it out there i mean i don't know if he's interested in making money on the album i don't think he really cares if it's commercially successful or not because he's got more money than he's gonna ever spend in his entire life um because of just who he is so i really think that and I could be totally wrong on this, but I really think that he just wants to get it out. I think he just wants to make it available for people to listen to. I think he's proud of the fact that he did an album with his dad and uncle, and he wants people to experience what he's really proud of. Now, as far as the album itself, sure, it was a commercial failure, and here's why. Musically... I personally feel, and, and I want to get your opinion on this, musically, in my opinion, it might be one of their best albums, and here's why, because I'm not banging on your guy Michael Anthony, I know we've joked around about that on the past, but from a musicianship perspective, Michael Anthony can't hold Wolfie's jockstrap, and that's a fact. Wolfgang is just a much better musician, and I think as a result of that, Eddie could spread out a little more. I just feel like he was just able to do a little bit more on this album than he ever was able to do in the past because Wolfie could keep up with him. Um, and, and I can hear that, and it's apparent. Um, and the reason why the album sucked is not because of the music, because the music is not good, it's great. And it's not because of the lyrics, because the lyrics, Dave always has written very clever, that I've always liked Dave's lyrics. I think they've always been very well done, but his vocals are ass. And that's why people hate the album, in my opinion. He sounds like shit on this album. He ruins the entire album because he sounds old. He sounds like he's pressing. He sounds like he's forcing it too much. He sounds really bad. And that overshadows just how good the, the, the other parts of the album is. And I just don't think... I think Dave doesn't really care about anything else except for Dave's part of this album. And that's why he's putting the hammer down on it. Um... I love the album and I have no trouble with Dave's vocal performance on the record. Um, the album was reviewed favorably and fans for the most part love the album and think that if, uh, if it wasn't for this record, Van Halen's studio output ends with Van Halen three and Gary Sharon, which is a truly <laughs> bad record. This no, record, that's a bad album. this record, most Van Halen fans love it and feel like it was a return to form and half the record is old demos from the 1970s so they the, the truth of the matter is they had a lot of difficulty in recording the record because they don't like each other and you know so there's <laughs> that's just a reality of it so it's difficult to make music with people you don't like and that tension yep. served them well in the 1970s but whenever you get to be 50 some years old, it can be just like, you know, which they were at the time. It's like, well, why are we doing this? But the record, I mean, I pulled it up on Wikipedia. I mean, the yep. the ratings across the board are four out of five stars, pretty much all the way down. It was pretty well received on average. So, yep. you know, 
I love the record. I think it's I I really do, and I love the Me fact too. that they they took they took chances on it. I really I really don't think when I listen to it, I don't think about the musicianship. I think about the fact that they got weird on it, which is what they did on the best '70s Van Halen records, where they experimented. I'm talking about songs like "Honey Sweetie," "Baby Doll," and "As Is," where they just got really kind of strange with the music. Mm -hmm. And I respected the fact that they were, you know, taking chances like that. Even they weren't just going to put out a, an attempt at a singles record. They were still taking some creative, you know, chances musically, which I dug. I honestly think this is just about money. I honestly do, and I do think he, okay. I think he's telling the truth in this video. I don't think it's necessary, and I'm not arguing for you to feel differently about it because I hate the position it puts fans in. Them getting into this war puts Van Halen nuts like me in a weird spot because I want to love Wolfie's output and his contributions to the band, and I want to love Dave's as well. And so this stuff just makes me uncomfortable. I hate that this is happening, but I honestly think it's just about money. Van Halen's catalog was with Warner Brothers. This record, they didn't have a contract. It ended up going out on Interscope. So for this record, it had a length of time. It could be available on streaming. The contract has expired. So rights to the record have to be renegotiated. A new deal with streaming services have to be, has to be renegotiated. And as Roth says, they took a bath on the record to begin with. And he also says that he and his uncle Al in the video, he says, we're not willing to lose any more money on this album. And they're going to make virtually nothing financially from streaming services, just like every other artist does. And so they're just not willing to do it. For Wolfie, it's super important because he's of the generation that listens to music via streaming. These are two guys like Dave's 68 years old. I'm sure Al is that or older. These are guys, their frame of reference isn't that. This isn't important to them. They look at as they look at it as another money loss and additional money they have to spend in lawyers to uh, you know to make all this happen i honestly just think it's a money thing and they're just simply he and al are just simply not willing to pony up for this record that they view as a commercial failure and at the end of the day i think that's what matters to them you know yeah my well, opinion it, oh no it, well put well put well sammy sammy hagar has um piped in on this scott um he you know is aware of this whole thing and um here here's what uh, uh sammy had to say um regarding you know roth david lee roth's comments he says quote look if you really think about what he said it's like it's like do i sense a little tinge of jealousy in there or something I mean, honestly, the only thing I can say without being cruel is he needs to find a new dispensary. The one is not working for him. And then, uh, um, it was, um, okay. Uh, regarding the, the, uh, tour, uh, Hagar said, uh, he had planned to invite every musician in every town. Um, with, with regard to, uh, David Lee Roth, he said, he can only come out and sing a song on a show or two, Hager explained, adding there was no fucking way he'd do an entire tour with him. Um, quote. So th there, there's Sammy Hagar's comments. I don't expect him to have a very objective opinion on this for obvious reasons. Um, it was just interesting what he had to say. Um, I, 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 I <laughs> he's taking his position on that, which is, which is fine. But uh, yeah, I mean, you made some great points, man. I mean, I, I fully understand if if uh if from david lee roth's perspective it is a completely a money thing because it, it would be you know what i mean uh it, and that's big generational difference between you know a 68 year old boomer and wolfie who's uh who he's like not even a millennial he's a he's a gen zer and and those are two those are like two generations three generations apart there is a pretty big difference of mindset there and i think it's being reflected in what we're seeing here with this album where i wolfie wants to get it out there because that's just what you do 
David Lee Roth sees it as a completely financial thing, and he just is not willing to do that. So I don't know. It'll be interesting to see where this all goes. I mean, th this is this is I I, I can't I, I I can't wait to see what happens next, Scott. Time will tell. <laughs> we got we got uh, time for uh, one more quick one. So um, the the uh, I, I didn't I know you didn't watch the Grammys. I know you don't really care too much about the Grammys, but here's why I think I have a little bit of faith in the future of rock, Scott. Because um, you know, in a previous episode, I don't remember which one it was. But, you know, we, we often hear talk about uh, not only the fact that, that rock is dead, but how we would like to find somebody or something to revive it, right? That's why we do this. That's why we talk about it, because we, we don't want it to die. We want it to keep going in whatever form makes sense, right? And, and I think you're the one that said something to the fact of, well, really, the only thing that's going to save rock is if women take it over, right? I th do you remember saying something like that? I do, but I can't remember if I lopped it off the end of the episode or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in uh, this year's Grammys, which was just a couple of days ago, this gives me a little faith in the future of rock because um, the, uh, the Grammy for best rock song went to an all-female group um called boy genius i believe they're called um let me verify that give me a second here they are called uh boy genius the song is not strong enough um an all-girl band who won best rock song and scott not only that but the Grammy for Best Alternative Music Performance and the Grammy for Best Rock Album went to Paramore, who's fronted by a female. This is the first time that has ever happened that the Grammy for the Best Rock Album went to a band fronted by a girl, by a woman. And I think that's pretty fucking awesome. Um, I've talked before, my favorite little niche in the 90s that I love so much, it, there was a, a, a dearth if you will, of great female artists. And for these for these acts to win these awards this year in the Grammys, that's a really great thing. I, I love it, and it gives me a little bit of faith that rock maybe isn't completely dead. Right on, man. I don't have any uh, Grammy uh, commentary, but if, it was, uh, if, if this is a good thing, then I'm all for a good thing. Um, so, hey, listen, let's take a quick break. And when we get back, we're going to talk, dude, some fucking Iron Maiden, man. So uh, stick around. Looking for a good rock and roll book? Do you watch a ton of rock and roll documentaries like I do? Well, that's why I started the Rock Talk Studio podcast. It'd be the place to go for previews, reviews, and recommendations of rock and roll books, documentaries, and movies. Every first Tuesday of the month, the Rock Talk Studio gets you caught up on all the latest and points out where to go for the good stuff. Give me 20 minutes and I'll get you caught up on the world of rock and roll books, docs, and movies from every possible angle and leave you with a no doubt decision on where to spend your time and money. Fan or just casual fan, or maybe you're on the fence and just looking for something new to check out. Either way, I got you covered. Recently on the show, I've talked about books and documentaries from everyone and everything from David Bowie, Randy Rhodes, and the Allman Brothers, to the Abbey Road Studios, Cheap Trick, Stevie Ray Vaughan, Little Richard, and more. Join me, Big Rick, every Tuesday of the month as I host the Rock Talk Studio podcast, the ultimate review of rock and roll books, documentaries, and movies. Our Mind on Music is a podcast that covers all things music. We cover all genres, and we welcome all perspectives, from musicians, producers, and content creators, to music enthusiasts. We have discussions, interviews, opinions, and much, much more. We hope you'll join us every week, Our Mind on Music, on YouTube and all streaming platforms. We are gathered here to remember rock and roll. Rock was born the rambunctious son of country, western, and blues. In the year of our Lord, 1955, on this day, the birth of rock and roll, gifted under the world a gyrating pelvis, a throbbing beat, and a pulsating rhythm, a sound so infectious and rollicking 
that it would endow previously scrupulous young minds with identity, individualism, and purpose, thus setting forth a multi-generational pursuit of all that is loud, debaucherous, and unholy. But, sadly, like all earthly endeavors, rock too must perish. Oh, we mourn the loss of rock and roll, with its ridiculously old standard bearers still on tour and charging ungodly amounts of mad jack to witness their long past the sell by date asses on stage, and with its chauvinism, misogyny, and whiteness no longer aligning with modern sensibilities, and with its aging, fist shaking fan base kicking every would-be rocker off their proverbial lawn, rock has indeed passed into the celestial void. May rock rest in peace in eternal cacophonous slumber. Amen. Thank you for that, Scott. You are listening to the Rock and Roll Autopsy Podcast. The Autopsy Report. Hey, all right. Welcome back to our autopsy. Um, First of all, before we get into the autopsy report, I would just like to express our sincere gratitude to all of our listeners out there all over the globe, all over the Milky Way, who are tuning in to listen to us talk Iron Maiden tonight. So thanks to all of you for giving us motivation to do this, because without you guys, we're just a couple of dudes, man. So having said that, let's get into this. Hey, bring your daughter or daughters to the slaughter by iron maiden dude that's what we're talking tonight this is off of their album well originally not meant for the album we'll get into that originally intended for nightmare on elm street part four but wound up on the album no prayer for the dying it's almost five minutes long bruce dickinson wrote it um uh, there's two versions of this scott as you know you're way more dialed into iron maiden than i am Um, So I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. But yeah, EMI label, Bruce Dickinson wrote it. But dude, did this song fucking slaughter rock and roll? I don't know. We're going to find out. Thank you, Rico. Rock and roll autopsy. Iron Maiden making their second appearance on the show way back when the show launched. We did a Sinjutsu episode where we just kind of reviewed that album. Yep. Do you remember? I do. I like Sen- I like the bloatiness of Senjutsu. I know we talked about that, the three of us, when we were at our thing, um, and how the bloatiness people don't like. But I like the bloatiness of Senjutsu. You know what I remember most about our Senjutsu episode? <laughs> that we what? recorded it twice because the audio <laughs> right. fucked up on it. And so I can remember just trudging through the conversation a second time. Yeah. Completely annoyed. And ultimately that's what becomes the episode that represents the stupid podcast. Well, and, and at the time, you know, we were still kind of greenhornish with this. And so we weren't the pros that we are now. So we had to do it a second time and pretend like we didn't talk about it the first time, which now we've actually done that since then and have gotten much better at that. But at the time it was fucking painful, dude. It was awful and very uncomfortable. Yeah. And we hadn't even developed our proprietary science yet. At that point, we were still in the lab perfecting it before we rolled it out for the first ever autopsy episode of 17 by winger. Go back and listen to it. Ladies and germs. Listen, bring your daughter to the slaughter off of no prayer for the dying. We're back in 1990, right? Yep. Listen, man, I can remember, let me just be uncle Scott here where we Rico, go ahead and climb on up onto my lap here. I'm going to tell you a story. (laughs) All right. 1990. 
I was a sophomore in high school and we had, this is before school shootings were running rampant throughout the country. And we had way more like lax rules around safety. We didn't have metal detectors or barely had security, that kind of thing. So for our school lunch, we had open lunch. We were allowed to leave the premises, which is no longer allowed. So for our school lunch, if I didn't walk down to Thurmont house and smoke weed, I would instead walk to Quonset hut in Wallhaven and buy music. And so on this day, the day no prayer for the dying was released on my lunch hour from school. I made the walk from Firestone high school to Wallhaven, And I plunked down $10 and bought the cassette of no prayer for the dying. And I popped it in my Walkman and listened to it walking all the way back and made it back to the high school in time to, for my next class, no problem. Continued to listen to the cassette tape the rest of the day and all the classes instead of paying attention. So I intimately remember this record as a part of my life. And spoiler alert, I also remember being crushingly disappointed by this record <laughs> because up until this time, Iron Maiden's uh, Iron Maiden's output uh, up until this time was unassailable. I mean, they yeah. literally were putting out perfect records for like a six album run. And this was the first stumbling block in their discography so spoiler alert let's get to it man rock and roll autopsy no prayer for the dying up the irons iron maiden 1990 we've got proprietary science on our side rico you can get off my lap now story time is over it's comfy though yeah um <laughs> proprietary science maybe how are we going to find out if it killed rock and roll we're going to use five categories proven categories category one gratuitous boomerism category two excessive misogyny category three wanton whiteness category four malignant machismo and category five culture vulturism rico the track is Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, the band Iron Maiden, the album No Prayer for the Dying of the Year, 1990, the category Gratuitous Boomerism. Sir, how do you score? Um, Isn't really, I mean, yes, we're just talking about this song. It, is this song guilty of gratuitous boomerism? I would say, Scott, when you're talking about... I mean, listen, the, the new wave of British heavy metal is ultimately inherent, really boomeristic. I think there's really no doubt about that. You know, there's the the obligatory 0.5 because they're all really old now. So we can go that route, too. But this song, Scott, bring your daughter to the slaughter. L let her go. Let her go. We'll get into that part. I don't want to steal your thunder. That's the most important part of our autopsy is the next category. But I will say that, fuck yes, this is a plus one for a gratuitous boomerism. I mean, the style of music is boomer. The I mean, the there's nothing not boomer about it, dude, right? Am I wrong here? Plus one. So... Of course, we have, uh, and I'm not going to go through the ages of the entire band, but right. pretty safe to say there are no Gen Xers present. This is yeah. a, they're all uh, boomeristic, but we'll look at Bruce Dickinson, who was, as he sang in his solo album, which also came out in this same year. We'll get to that. He had a yeah. track on there called Born in 58, which he actually is, which makes him 65 firmly ensconced in the boomer generation. And then the other person who has ownership of this band, the true uh, leader of this band and founder is Steve Harris. And he's two years older, 67. So it's certainly boomerific. Now to your point, subject matter wise, um, a little off the beaten path for Iron Maiden, a band that typically sings about like history. <laughs> <laughs> you know um so this is but this album is an album that signifies change in the band and 
um the song and the tone of the record the musical the new musical direction of the record all signify changing times in the band and they're adopting a more straight ahead uh hard rock sound kind of casting aside their progier more self-indulgent elements and going for uh straight ahead it's casting aside their literary lyrics and their history buff lyrics casting it aside and going with a straight ahead hard rock song with some metal subject matter um and was it done strictly for commercial purposes of trying in an attempt to get on a nightmare on elm street soundtrack i mean that would be boomerific wouldn't it um sure just would. chasing those dollars right um yep. So I'm going to score it a full one as well. I think there's myriad boomerism at work here. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go with the plus one. We'll get to more of the finer points of this conversation later. Yes. I'm certain up next, we've got excessive misogyny and Rico. I have the lyrics available if you'd like to hear them, but first it's almost Valentine's day. Um, these are the times when we get together with our loved ones and you know maybe try to get a little bit of action you know it's kind of like maybe the one time of year where you actually can get some action like voluntarily from your loved one instead of kind of like forcing them into it whether by guilt or otherwise um but imagine you know you guys are in in an intimate position and you're you're you, sh the guy girl you know we're an equal opportunity employer here so whether it's a guy or a girl you know they get ready do you guys do the undress thing and oh you got the little pee dribbles on your underwear just when things are getting hot and heavy that is a big old screeching halt right there there is there is no bigger cock block than when the person is trying to undress you because they want to get busy and then they see the pee dribbles on your underwear let's not do that well there's a solution to that and now we've got the valentine's day series of the cock cap we've got white with red and pink hearts we've got pink with white and red hearts and we've got pink with white and red hearts so you can get all three and then you can choose which ones you want to wear for your valentine's day date so get the cock cap, get the Valentine's Day cock cap for Valentine's Day, and get busy without the really embarrassing cock block. Back to you, Scott. Honey, it's getting close to midnight, and all the mists are still in town. True love and lipstick on your linen. Bite the pillow, make no sound. If there's some living to be done before your life becomes your tomb, You'd better know that I'm the one. Unchain your back door. Invite me around. Bring your daughter. Bring your daughter to the slaughter. Let her go. Let her go. Let her go. Bring your daughter. Bring your daughter to the slaughter. Let her go. Let her go. Let her go. Let her go. Yeah. Ha, 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 ha. Honey, it's close to daybreak. The sun is creeping in the sky. No patent remedies for heartache, just empty words and humble pie. So get down on your knees, honey. Assume an attitude. You just pray that I'll be waiting because you know, you know, I'm coming soon. Bring your daughter, et cetera, et cetera. Would you need any more lyrics, Rico, to determine whether there's excessive misogyny at work here? No, but once again, your spoken word gets a big giant chef's kiss from me. So well done. Um, okay, excessive misogyny. So um, I don't have the breadth of Iron Maiden uh, knowledge as you do, but from what I know of Iron Maiden, they're wheelhouse if you will are these super bloated long historical like battle cry like songs right um and and for them to and again i could be way way off base here but hey science right um so i i don't get the impression that 
it's in Bruce Dickinson's wheelhouse to write double entendre lyrics that it appears that we have here. If you look at it, it looks like it's double entendre material here. So if it was originally written for Nightmare on Elm Street, if you put those lenses, if you put horror movie lenses on when you look at those lyrics, then sure, that kind of fits in, right? But if you put double entendre lyrics on, then you could see it in a different way, obviously. Um, but hey, do we separate the art from the artist? Artist intent doesn't matter. Remember, we had that discussion a long time ago. It really doesn't matter what they were intending. It's all on what I'm perceiving as the listener. And so I'm seeing the double entendre, and I'm seeing some really misogynistic lyrics here. So for me, I'm going to give it a plus one. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, even if, okay, so you can take it as this is uh, intended for the soundtrack to what was it? Nightmare on Elm Street five, maybe one of the four. It was four. four. Okay. Like Street of Dreams or whatever the hell it's called. What, what are they on? Let's see. Dream Child or is that Dream, no, Dream Warriors was three. I don't know. The Nightmare on Elm Street movies just uh, the dream. Uh, no, it was five. Uh, five. The Dream Child. Dream Child. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, you could one could argue that just doing or contributing a heavy metal track to an 80s horror movie one it's one of the most cliched things one could do every metal band at some point in the 80s contributed a song to a horror movie <laughs> and two there's definitely like the venn diagram of like horror and heavy metal is just like a, it's just a flat circle right it's just all filled in because <laughs> <laughs> and both of them occupied generally a space. They were both happy to live in the world of excessive misogyny, right? I mean, yeah. just horror movies in general in the 80s, every single one of them had gratuitous nudity, all violence towards women. Every act three of every 80s horror movie consists of a villain with some kind of phallic weapon chasing sure the sole surviving female. So just by contributing to the, to that <laughs> discourse with a song, you kind of walk into it a little bit there. And to your point, yeah, the lyrics are, if you look at them from a double entendre perspective, it's all there, right? Where we've got lipstick on the linen, we're biting pillows, make no sound. We're getting down on our knees. We're assuming an attitude because you know, I'll be coming soon, right? Um, <laughs> and to your point, Iron Maiden historically, not it's it's very much a sexless band. Okay, with the exception of two songs, there is a mini series that they do on Charlotte the Harlot, where it's about they do a two song story. Uh, there's the track Charlotte the Harlot, and then there's its sequel, 22 Acacia Avenue. Um, one track appears on their first record, the other track appears on the number of the Beast record. So they do have a two song story of a woman who has become a prostitute, but the Bruce Dickinson character in this story tries to get her rescue her from that life. Okay. So it's actually kind of not coming from that direction, but by and large, Iron Maiden, a sexless band, this band, does, there is no, it's, it's all history and Samuel Taylor Coleridge poetry. <laughs> and it's just, I mean, it, they write about movies and books. I mean, it's just nothing. And the fucking Viking assault on Northern Europe in the like 1200s and shit. <laughs> That's exactly right. This is the subject matter they write about. So, um, so yeah, I have to score it a plus one. There's a lot actually at work here. It is way out of character for Iron Maiden. We'll get there a little bit more. Uh, yeah. Plus one for me for excessive misogyny. Agree completely, Rico. Category three. Wanton whiteness. Bring your daughter to the slaughter. Rico, how do you score? Yeah, um, well, uh, let's transition from the proggy stage one of Iron Maiden 
to this current version in this album where they've kind of gone to your point to more of a straightforward metal kind of a non it's it's a little bit different for them but still regardless dude it's it's a white british metal band there's nothing whiter than that we've mentioned this many times this is whiter than what and when you take a white british heavy metal band and you connect that to the nightmare on elm street a commercially gigantic in its fifth episode so now we're milking it for money and it's not even good anymore so that's even whiter than white right there so now it's whiter than white so this is like blinding white it's so white that it's burning my retina white so it's a plus burning retina white number one for me yeah i mean um great you just verbalized that so well about a nightmare on Elm street. Cause if you watch, you know, recently all of the movies were on shutter and I watched them all because I hadn't seen them in a while and they just get progressively worse. And there is that sentiment that they're just milking the proverbial cow. The, the yeah, further sure. they go. So, um, yeah, wants in whiteness. I mean, I, I can't disagree with anything you're saying. I mean, iron maiden are, oh my gosh. So, I think I'm going to go with this here a little. No, you know what? I'm going to hold it for the next. You want to save it? All right. I'm going to save it. Um, All right. Yeah, I'm just going to. I'm just going to basically uh, endorse everything you laid out in your point. It was well said, and this is just white ass music. <laughs> You hit on it all. There's no reason for me to simply make an attempt to repeat it or add to it. So I will just co-sign. So I will give it a plus one as well. Category four, malignant machismo. Rico, how do you score? I don't know. Like this for this category, like he had me at um on your knees and assume an attitude and um, because you know I'm coming, and there was that line about opening the back door. I mean, Bruce Dickinson making double on Chandra's about anal. I mean, is are we going there with him? That's way out of his wheelhouse, dude. Seriously, I mean, I have I'm having trouble connecting that lyric to Nightmare on Elm Street, but whatever, man. Like whatever. I mean, you know, that's his process. Or is it, I mean, we did read like just recently what perhaps his real motivation was with this song. I don't know if you want to go there or not. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Um, Rico, <laughs> go there. Uh, all right. So uh, this is from Song Facts. Uh, not Song Meaning. We, we frequent that website. Uh, you like to talk about that but this was on song facts okay um apparently scott and everyone out there in the universe who listens to us uh bruce dickinson explained his process on this he said quote fingers here i tr i'm not going to use a british accent because i'm not very good at that so just pretend i'm bruce dickinson okay here i tried to sum up what i thought nightmare on elm street movies are really about what do you think who made nightmare on elm street movies who, who is that person you cleveland's know. own wes craven okay. did the original but by the time you get to he only did the first one and the sixth one by the time you get to the no he did the first one and then wes craven's new nightmare the fifth one he had nothing to do with the fourth the third the second the sixth he had nothing to do but he was the one who came up with Freddy Krueger came up with this whole dream murderer thing and Got did it. the first and best Nightmare on Elm Street movie. Okay, so um, if there was anybody that I know of besides Joe Bob Briggs who could be construed or labeled or identified as a horror movie aficionado, um, I would say that would be you. Um, you are you are a uh, horror movie aficionado. What, in your opinion, is the metaphor for Nightmare on Elm Street? Go. I I don't know that it, it has one, and it's not going to be what you're going to propose. But <laughs> according to Bruce Dickinson, he has a different opinion than you do. So. He says, here, I was trying to sum up what I thought Nightmare on Elm Street, uh, all, all of the movies were really about. It's about adolescent fear of period pains, Scott. 
That's what I think it is deep down. When a young girl first gets her period, she bleeds and it happens at night. It always happens at night, Scott. I mean, I, I'm not a woman and I don't play one on TV yet, but I even I know that girls only have their period at nighttime and, and never at any other time of day. Okay, um, it happens at night. And so she's afraid to go to sleep and it's very terrifying time for her sexually as well, Scott and nightmare on Elm street targets that fear. The real slaughter in the Freddy movies is when she loses her virginity, which I don't know where that came from because he was talking about period pains a second ago. That's okay though. Um, that is the rather nasty thought behind it all. But that's what makes those kind of movies frightening. End quote. Uh, um, go. Your thoughts? Well, I, let's just, <laughs> let's go to the source. Wes Craven. <laughs> <laughs> explained that the, uh, the movie is actually about the sins of the parents being visited upon the children because Freddy is a uh, child murderer and yes. rapist who is murdered by the parents and comes back yeah. to uh, finish the job in their in their dreams. And the movie yeah. is fraught with uh, Freudian sexual images. Um, so there's that element as well, but nothing about about periods. Sorry. Period uh, so, yeah. Um, uh, 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 I, I know it may come uh, uh, as a little bit of a surprise, but for malignant machismo for me for this song, it's going to have to get a 1.0. Rico, the thing that Iron Maiden does with this record, <laughs> and I think you have to, and I'm going to talk a little bit about Iron Maiden, the band here at this point. It's pretty can well I, wait, documented. Can I, can, I, can I sit on your lap for this again? Come on up, man. Have a yes. seat. Yes, can I? Do you, you had a banana in your pocket last time? <laughs> Iron Maiden, the band, um, had reached kind of a breaking point by 1990. It's well documented that um, Bruce Dickinson thought the band needed to do a change in direction after the Power Slave record, and he wanted the next record to be more acoustic and kind of folky. And instead they did the exact opposite. Bruce got no writing credits and they did a synth style record with blade runner themes, which would become fan favorite somewhere in time. And then they would go on to, after seeing the success that operation mind crime by Queensryche had, they decided they wanted to do a concept album. And so they did another synth record and this time their attempt at a concept album called seventh son of a seventh son which bruce thought while the songs were good conceptually didn't hold a candle to operation mind crime and he thought they did a poor job with it bruce was unhappy because now they don't go acoustic on somewhere in time and then they make a concept album that he didn't feel was successful with seventh son so bruce wants to do a solo album and Bruce does a solo record called Tattooed Millionaire, which is super stripped down. It's got ACDC style tracks on it. It's like just balls out simple rock and roll that you never hear Bruce Dickinson do ever in Iron Maiden. So Bruce like got it out of his system. Only he didn't. <laughs> the sound of Tattooed Millionaire creeps into No Prayer for the Dying and you hear it in this track and you hear it in Holy Smoke and other tracks on that record where it doesn't sound like Iron Maiden anymore. And Bruce changes his singing approach. He's becoming more Brian Johnson like he's not operatic anymore. He's getting very growly and kind of a lot of a lot of grit and a lot more distortion to his vocal on this yep. record instead of the super clean operatic highs because that's the eighties, right? And now we're in right. the nineties and we can't do operatic highs anymore. We have no. to do gritty stuff and we have to get darker, right? Yep. It doesn't work. And I hate <laughs> Bruce's vocals on this record. So if we're in the category of malignant machismo and you've eschewed prog rock and book metal for crotch rock and gritty vocals, 
you have by a definition adopted a more macho stance have you not if you've said let's do away with all that nose in the air pinky extended long instrumental breaks in the middle of our songs let's get simpler and more more cocky more more in the groin region let's get more focused on rico you know there's there's that guy in metallica and i really like the way that he stands i i can just know that's going through bruce dickinson's mind at the time yeah it's he's even adopting a little hetfield grit to his voice here in this record <laughs> isn't he so i'm gonna score it for malignant machismo and the cross-pollination of the straight ahead rock and roll of tattooed millionaire into no prayer for the dying. And Oh, by the way, this is a band that's about to get a divorce because on the next record, fear of the dark, they course correct a little bit, but it's got a lot of this rock and roll stuff in it. And Bruce ultimately announces I'm leaving the band and they conduct a tour with a lead singer who has told the band he's leaving which makes the entire tour fraught with tension and awkward for everyone involved. Yeah. And so this is the end of Iron Maiden we're witnessing here at this point, <laughs> at least version two of the band. Right. All right, let's move on. Culture vulturism and wrap this bad boy up. Rico, yeah. bring your daughter to the slaughter. How do you score, sir? Yeah, it, every you you all of the stuff that you just laid out while I was sitting on your lap for the second time transitioned nicely into this category. They've gone out of their way to change what put them on the planet in order to stay relevant. That, sir, is culture vulturism. Plus one. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you have, I mean, how can someone argue with it? I have to give it a plus one as well. When you're changing your sound to be relevant, stay in the times, it's culture vulturism. When your band has put out six consecutive albums that your fans think are unimpeachable, are perfect records, and you say, we can't do perfect anymore. We're done with this crap. It's the 90s. Let's change. Let's get more, let's get more crotch rocky. Um yeah, dude, it's an absolute plus one. Rocky. And whenever you're <laughs> when you're writing songs and lyrics that you've never written before that don't fit the image you've established as a band, that don't align with your mission statement as a band, that's the big problem with No Prayer for the Dying. Not if if Iron Maiden has a mission statement that Steve Harris set forth for the band, they don't align to any of their values as a band on this record. They, they yep. toss them all out the window. And oh, by the way, Adrian Smith, one of their best songwriting contributors and second guitar player, quit the band at this point because he was like, okay, I don't like the direction of Iron Maiden. I don't recognize the band I'm in anymore. And he quits. And then Yannick Gers from the Tattooed Millionaire record comes on the band and takes his place. So this Tattooed Millionaire album is seeping in to Iron Maiden proper. And it's just not Maiden anymore. Um, I'd love to hear what the Maidenheads have to say about this record. Um, so yeah, it's a strong plus one for culture vulturism a couple other things of note before we tally them up yep. the song hit number one on the charts in the uk it's their only uk number one and it also won a golden raspberry for worst original song in 1989 <laughs> so it's I mean, it's a, it's a, you know, it's the Sybil of rock songs, right? I mean, there's weirdness and success happening at the same time. Well, some might argue that the reason why it did so well commercially was the method and timing in which it was released. It was like right after Christmas time and released as I, I, I think I read somewhere that it was released as a set, which kind of skewed the numbers and the timing being right after Christmas. So it, there wasn't really any competition. And so it kind of benefited from some interesting strategy there, but that's just what I read on the internet anyway. One other final tidbit before we tally the yep. band, the album actually has three different covers because the band in the original cover had Eddie coming out of a grave and strangling their manager, Ron Smallwood. <laughs> and 
he <laughs> needless to say was not happy with that and in the subsequent editions uh the band uh acquiesced and agreed to have his likeness removed from eddie's uh eddie's hands wrapped around his throat and removed entirely from the cover so if you're curious check them out it's kind of fun to see the early versions with their manager depicted being strangled by eddie and eh, that dude needs to lighten up a little bit it was all in good fun i'm sure <laughs> all right rico let's tally them up what have yeah. you got i've got oh i add mine up first right yep why can't i get this straight that's all right all right i've got let's see i've got five points rico five points for bring your daughter to the slaughter is that your first five ever? it might be yeah well let me see here interesting all right let me seven plus four carry the two Scott, I know for a fact that this is my very first five. So I also have five. For a grand total of our very first 10.0. Wow. This song annihilated rock and roll. The science dude. I love it. It's amazing. It took 113 episodes to get a perfect to get our first 10. To I get know. a perfect score. Listen, guys, I know the year has gotten off to a rocky start. We have challenged you with eclectic song choices. We've given you Paula Cole and Billy Squire and fucking Falco. But tonight, <laughs> you got a big, juicy, heavy metal haymaker thrown 100 miles per hour right over the plate so if this doesn't bring back our true core audience of listeners to say hey rock and roll autopsy you're finally doing again what we love and that is looking at old ass 80s heavy metal (laughs) hey we're we're still here for you we're we, we never went anywhere we've always been here sometimes you just gotta you know expand your horizons a little bit you know there's more things that destroyed rock than old ass white 80s heavy metal and it's up to us it's incumbent upon us it's our responsibility to not leave any of that out and don't worry uh ladies and germs things are going to start getting weirder here in terms of song selection in the very near future you've been warned but enjoy this big juicy fastball it's iron maiden you can't go wrong if nothing else i look forward to the conversation am i totally wrong in saying this is the beginning and the end of the band i don't know rico thank you sir and thank you as well all right gang it's been rock and roll autopsy good night now Let me have that special rock and roll music. Yeah! Let me tell you, so the lyrics to real rock music is nothing more than satanic cyanide. Get it out of your house, throw it out, and burn it. It has no place in the house of the righteous. You guys, you stuck a mistake. There's no mistake anymore. Oh, baby! Doctor! To the door! Love it! To the morning! I'm gone! I'm gone! Follow us on Twitter at RNR Autopsy, or you can send an email to rockandrollautopsy at gmail.com. And if we run across anything good, We'll mention it in a future episode. Thanks for listening. Later. Well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Before you go, if you like heavy metal and stories, then you'll love Battle of the Bands, the narrative form metal podcast that unpacks the biggest rivalries in rock and metal history. Season one took in Megadeth versus Metallica and Season 2 went across the divide to explore the beef between Judas Priest and Iron Maiden. It's like Business Wars, but metal. 
Find Battle of the Bands wherever you listen to your podcasts or visit battleofthebandspod.com.